Hello and welcome to Understanding Adventist Beliefs. If you want to know more about Seventh-day Adventists and what they believe, this is for you. I have invited theological experts to join us for a frank discussion about Adventist faith and practice. We will explore the biblical reasons why Adventists believe what they confess in their fundamental belief. And we invite you to reflect with us in greater depth the biblical meaning, beauty, and relevance of Adventist beliefs. My name is Frank Hazel. I'm your host. And today we will look more closely at fundamental belief number 16, the Lord's Supper. Today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Laszlo Galusz and Keldi Porosky as my conversation partners. Dr. Galusz is originally from Serbia, although he is Hungarian by nationality. He holds a PhD degree in New Testament from Karoli Gaspar Reformed University in Budapest, Hungary. Currently, he is a senior lecturer in New Testament at Newbold College and a program director in the Department of Theological Studies. Keldi Poroski is originally from Brazil, but has lived many years in Central Europe and currently is a PhD student in New Testament studies at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. I was born and raised in Germany and currently work as an associate director of the Biblical Research Institute at the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. Laszlo, Keldi, thank you for joining me in this conversation about the biblical teaching of the Lord's Supper and what it means for Seventh-day Adventists. Now, before we will enter into a discussion, I think it will be helpful to read the actual words of that fundamental belief number 16 so that we have a better understanding of what we are talking about. So here I quote, the Lord's Supper is a participation in the emblems of the body and blood of Jesus as an expression of faith in him, our Lord and Savior. In this experience of communion, Christ is present to meet and strengthen his people. As we partake, we joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Preparation for the Lord's Supper includes self-examination, repentance, and confession. The master ordained the service of foot washing to signify new cleansing to express a willingness to serve one another in Christ-like humility and to unite our hearts in love. The communion service is open to all believing Christians. That's the wording of that particular fundamental belief. And so I would like to start our conversation by, uh, by asking this question. Uh, it is interesting, if we look uh, in all Christian churches, we find that all Christian churches celebrate the Lord's Supper in one way or another. So my question to you would be, what is the significance, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper for Christians and for Seventh-day Adventists in particular? First of all, greetings to all who are watching this program. And thank you, Frank, for invitation to be with you in this program. I think this is a very, very important topic. And when we talk about the Lord's Supper, we shall relate it to baptism. Baptism is kind of initiation rite in Christianity. If you decide to follow Jesus, if you decide to spend eternity with him, you will request to be baptized. And through baptism, you are establishing a covenant with God. So covenant is, is the foundation of, of, of the relationship with, with, with God. And uh, the baptism is the first yes. The Lord's Supper is actually a time when we maintain that covenant, time when we confirm our yes. And it is a very vital part of Christian life. So we can say that um, the Lord's Supper continues what baptism began 
in our faith journey. We, con we confirm our decision, we pledge allegiance, we, we pledge uh, that we will follow, that we will follow this and express our devotion, devotion to him. Uh, this is very interesting uh, what you say, Laszlo. So the Lord's Supper is not just to be understood in isolation, but in continuation, so to speak, of something that has begun already in baptism mm -hmm. uh, when I decided to follow Jesus and uh, be a member of that covenant community that he has established. I also mm -hmm. like the wording in, that we have in our fundamental belief that um, as we partake, we joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Those are two very central aspects of our faith, understanding the meaning of Christ's death for me personally, um, mm -hmm. and at the same time, looking forward to the final completion of God's promises in at his second coming. Um, so, you know, whenever we partake in the Lord's Supper, it is that um, continuing remembrance and uh, um, reflection on the meaning of Christ's death and what he has done for us and what he continues and will do still for us in the future. Hmm. I think the basic context is what just Kelly stated, understanding of Christ's death, mm -hmm. which is very central in the New Testament. If you look at the Gospels, one third of Matthew's Gospel is about Christ's death. Mm -hmm. One third of Mark, one third of Luke, half of the Gospel of John is about the Passion Week. Yeah. So this is, this, this is the key event in salvation history. Yeah. Christ came, he died for us, and we belong to him. Mm -hmm. And with Lord's Supper, we are looking backwards mm -hmm. with thankfulness and we embrace the atoning sacrifice of Christ, mm -hmm. seeking the maintaining of the relationship. But at the same time, we are not only looking back, we are looking forward. Exactly. We, we are looking forward in anticipation that Christ will restore our planet mm -hmm. and he will fulfill his promises. So we can, we can say that there is a tension here looking backwards to the cross and looking forwards to a bright future with Christ in the new creation. So, um, so what would you say is then the significance of that particular rite, of that particular uh, ordinance of remembrance? I think like uh, Laszlo was saying, this is a, a repeated confirmation of our decision to follow Jesus, right? We, we still live in a world where sin is still present, um, death is still a reality, um, and yet we have decided in this world to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Um, and as we partake in the Lord's Supper, this is a, a continual reminder for ourselves that we have made a decision within this world where there are still very many different messages and, and conflicts and, and you know, sin and everything is still present. We have made a decision for on which side we want to stand. And so it's just that, that continuing confirmation um, that I think is very significant. Mm. Speaking with biblical language, covenant, the concept of covenant is, is, is one of the key concepts in the Bible. There have been many, many important studies. Uh, one was... Uh, Gerhard Kazel's study on, on covenant. Uh, Larondel wrote a book uh, suggesting that the covenant is the backbone of the Bible. Mm. The covenant uh, defines our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And the Lord's Supper is the opportunity to renew that covenant. We establish mm. the covenant with baptism and we renew and we seek the Lord's presence. And we seek, we say, yes, we want that covenant. We want to serve the Lord. So that's the key significance of, of, of the Lord's Supper. Very interesting. I, I like what you mentioned uh, just a little earlier, Laszlo. Uh, it's one of the obvious things in the New Testament, really. And because it's so obvious, we sometimes do not even recognize it. But that one third of the Gospels, even 50% of the Gospel of, of John, deals with the Passion Week, with the last couple days of Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. So um, even just taking that particular dimension shows us that for the writers of the Gospels, the death of Jesus Christ was the central uh, event, you know, more important than all the healing and all the preaching and all his earthly ministry in the three years before. That is really the high point of everything. And the Lord's Supper seems to remind ourselves of that important 
uh, deed that Jesus uh, did for us and the covenant that he established. No gospel expresses that uh, more beautifully than John's gospel. One of the key motifs in John's gospel is, is the, the hour, my hour, the hour of Jesus. From the beginning of the gospel, from chapter 2, Jesus says, my hour did not yet come. My hour did not yet come several times through his ministry. And when the Gethsemane comes, when, when, when the last events come, and he, he said, the hour has come. So that hour is our glorification, the hour of cross, the hour in which he wages victory over the forces of darkness and atones for our sins. The Lord's Supper can be related to that in the sense that Jesus established it during his last e evening, last night. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's his ordinance. Mm -hmm. It's not established by the church, but it originates from Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And that uh, stress is basically the significance of So is that the reason... Yeah. Is that perhaps the reason why the Lord's Supper is so significant and important to all Christians? Because it has been initiated uh, by Jesus Christ himself. I think that's definitely a very central part of it. Um, I would also add the, uh, the very words that Jesus says, pointing to the bread and to the wine and connecting that to his body, to his blood. So there's a very clear connection, not only to Jesus as the initiator of this ordinance, but as the significance of it. He himself places his death at the center of the significance of the ordinance. Hmm. Interesting. Of course, if you want to understand what is happening and why did he establish the the Lord's Supper, we, you need to pay uh, attention to the context in which he established it during his last night. And that was in the context of the Passover meal. Yes. Uh, give us that background of the Passover meal uh, so that we understand that better. Yes, the Passover meal was one of the key celebrations in the Jewish, in the Jewish calendar. The meal itself is the Seder meal. Mm -hmm. And it was a commemoration of the liberation of God's people from Egypt. Mm -hmm. the exodus and if you read the old testament from the very beginning from pentateuch from the book of exodus until until the end of old testament even in new testament very significant exodus is is a major topic god intervened god stepped up and he delivered his people and every year every year there was a celebration of that deliverance and that was the passover meal when they retold the story the story of God's faithfulness, of God's deliverance, with hope, with trust in the Lord. And that's the basic setting. Jesus has the Seder meal, the Passover meal with, with, with his disciples. And he points not only backwards and not only to the fulfillment of that Passover lamb, but he is the lamb of God. Okay, But he points forward to his kingdom when he will be together with his disciple, disciples. You know, that's something I really appreciate about the Bible is how... We have these these ordinances, these uh, celebrations of things, and it's all connected to the narrative, to the story that we find in the Bible of God's plan of salvation. So like you mentioned, the Passover, it's all about the story of God's delivering his people from Egypt, from captivity. Um, and then we have the Lord's Supper. It's, it's connected to, it's remembering the story of Jesus's death and him coming again. So it's all, um, you know, it's not just a, a, an abstract theological um, concept or something. It's really connected to the story of what God is doing and um, continuing to do it for, our, for us and for the world. I, I really find that Really uh, that meaningful. is that is indeed fascinating, and it it shows a, a general um, unity of old and New Testament uh, themes that that uh, are connected. Now, would you say then? Let me just pick up on what you just said, Keldy. Could we then say, or should we say, that the the, the Lord's Supper is really a, a continuation of the Passover, or is there more to it, or is it yeah. different? It's uh, in a way continuation, but also in a way a, a substitution, I would say, because I think the, the Passover points to the death of Christ and the, the Lord's Supper um, picks that up. But in, from the point of view of this has now been fulfilled, Christ has already died. So while the Passover looks forward to Christ's death in a certain way, um, the, the Lord's Supper looks backward to it. This has already happened. This is already a reality mm -hmm. that we can claim and um, that, you know, is part of our of our faith now. Any additional thoughts, Laszlo? Yes, God is in the center. 
mm-hmm. uh, the Lord's Supper is not uh, only about us, about our pledging of allegiance. So he's the faithful God. He is the one who delivers. He is mm. the one who, who works in favor of his people. And that's why they needed to re- retell every year the story. The concept of remembering is very important in the Bible. We tend to forget and we need to remind ourselves. You see, we tend to forget, we need to remind ourselves. And that's why they had Passover. But when you examine the Old Testament, New Testament relationship, you should do that in the framework of promise and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they were looking backwards. To, to deliverance from Egypt with hope into God's leadership. But in Jesus, the salvation history reached its climax. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cross of Christ and his resurrection, of course, they go together. That's the center of human history. Mm-hmm. That's the most important even in human history. The center of time, as the famous uh, Swiss theologian Oscar Kuhlmann would say. Yeah. The Christ event is the center of time. And the Lord's Supper actually points us to the center of time, to the cross of Christ and his resurrection, to remind us that we depend on him. We depend on him and it fosters our faith. It fosters our commitment, commitment to him. So, so the Lord's Supper, really the, the function of the ad, and the significant function of it, at least from the biblical perspective and the story in which it is included is to remember the saving acts of God, especially in his son, Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. for our salvation and what he has done in history. Let's celebrate that. And you know, that's an interesting, going back again to the Passover, the connections there. In the Old Testament, the Passover is specifically introduced as an occasion where the parents can tell their children the story of the Exodus. Hmm. Um, to share what God has done. And I believe the same thing happens with the Lord's Supper. It's an opportunity not just to partake in the ordinances, but to share the story of what Jesus has done for us. So it's really that, uh, like Leslie was saying, remembering and telling and sharing that story that is so significant for all of humankind. Mm. What I would like to point out and what, what becomes obvious from our discussion is that the Lord's Supper is a, is a complex concept. We cannot define in one sentence what is it about. It has several key aspects. So first of all, it is a reminder of the death of Christ, to the death of Christ, to the sacrificial character of his death. Also, it's a reminder to our dependence of Christ, to the vitality of the connection, the living connection with Christ. On the third place, it points forward to our blessed hope, to the second coming of Christ, to the restoration of all things. But also it has an uh, ecclesiological significance in terms that it uh, points to the unity of the believers. And I think we did not speak about that yet. The unity of the believers, the love and concern of believers for each other, because the bread is, is one and it is, it is broken. And the bread is the the body of Christ. It's his symbol of his sacrifice. But at the same time, the church is is the body. And uh, there is a need for for, for unity in in that body. So the the Lord's Supper has that uh, uh, vertical vertical dimension, but it has also a horizontal dimension. And that's why we have have the foot washing when we serve to Mm -hmm. to each other and Mm -hmm. demonstrate the love of Christ. Very, very interesting. Let's let's come to the foot washing in just a moment. Uh, let's first uh, focus on a, a little detail that that might be also obvious, but but yet uh, we don't uh, reflect that very often. You know, it's called the Lord's Supper, and the supper in the English language, at least, is is uh, is taken in the evening. It's an evening meal. So the Lord's Supper, if we take it just by the wording, uh, should be an evening meal. Why do we celebrate it usually in the morning uh, when we have church service? Uh, is, is there a particular reason behind that or is that just um, an incidental thing? Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting question and it seems maybe a funny question. But those who, who are not Christians uh, ask that question. You have the evening meal in the evening, not in the morning. That's logical, isn't it? Okay, but uh, of course, Jesus did not establish this meal in the 21st century. He established it 
in a cultural context in which the evening meal had a significance. Mm. So people were working 12 hours those days in fields, on different workplaces, and the working day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they had their breakfast, they had their lunch uh, in the field, on their workplaces, and so on. But the dinner was, the supper was something very, very special. That was an occasion, time for fellowship, time to deepen the relationship. In the first century culture, if you wanted to show someone a favor, you invited that per person, not, not, not for lunch, but for a supper, for an evening meal. That was a time when uh, relationships were built, relationships were deepened. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important. So the suppers were not brief suppers, 10, 15 minutes, okay? <laughs> they lasted usually about between two and three hours in the first century Palestine context, mm -hmm. because the point was not food. Mm -hmm. The point of supper was building relationship, Fellowship, sharing yeah. life, belonging. To, to each other and that's why Christ talks about about supper evening meal he wants a personal fellowship with us mm -hmm. that's very interesting you know as you as you were talking uh, Laszlo it reminded me and you might uh, uh, know that even better because you're a New Testament scholar and know the book of Revelation very well but in the book of Revelation you have that invitation to the Lord not the Lord's Supper but to the supper meal that he would like to celebrate with all the redeemed. Uh, isn't that a similar picture that he portrays there in the last book of, uh, uh, of the Bible that uh, shares that same concept of communion, of fellowship, of belonging uh, to him? Yes, if you, if you go even, even to Jewish writings from the intertestamental period, you have the idea of the messianic meal, messianic meal, the great hope when the kingdom of God is, is realized and you will have a meal with the Savior, meal with the Lord. And at the very end of Revelation, when Jesus already came and the problem of sin is dealt with, there is a marriage supper of the Lamb, mm -hmm. the marriage supper of the Lamb. Again, the essence is not food. The essence is building relationship, closeness, covenant. Mm -hmm. And just pointing out the practical side of things, you mentioned uh, it's common to celebrate it in the morning when we go to church and during the church service, um, but there's also flexibility there. Um, growing up at my church, we used to do um, the Lord's Supper uh, on Friday evenings um, at the end of a special week of prayer week where we would have um, sermons every night for a week. And then Friday was that culmination of that week where we would have communion um, at the end of this very special week of uh, important messages and like spiritual connection and everything. So there is flexibility in how we can celebrate it or when we can celebrate it as well. But again, it's the focus is on the fellowship and understanding the significance of what Christ has done for us With, within that context. There's different ways that we can implement that within our church services. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yes, go ahead, Laszlo. I remember when I was a young pastor, uh, and that was second my second district in, in, in Serbia. I had four churches in the district, and the second church, not the largest, they used to have the Lord's Supper always on 13th Sabbath, the end of, of each quarter, Sabbath morning. So that was the tradition. Yeah. And when I was ordained, they expected from me to serve them the Lord's Supper, but I had four churches. <laughs> so I could not. They had a or then the elder. And I said, you have a choice whether the elder will serve you or I come on Friday evening to serve the Lord's Supper <laughs> to you. And they said, the elder said, okay, okay. We never did that, but let's try. Mm -hmm. And it was it was so a beautiful occasion. And the elder said that we always want to have it on evening. <laughs> on evening. Yes. So there is a flexibility. Yeah. In Bible, we do not have a special prescription whether is it morning or evening or what time or what month or what what uh, what day the essence is important yeah, exactly. the essence the dedicated dedication of our life to, to to christ that's more important the content is more yes, important than yes, the yes, day yes. and time very well so let me let me pick up on that particular thought that both of you just mentioned so the essence is important uh what it signifies Let's go to the two 
perhaps uh, most uh, important symbols of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine. Uh, we'll talk about the foot washing as part of the Lord's Supper a little later, but let's focus first on the bread and the wine. Why um, exactly those two symbols? Uh, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on the meaning of those symbols and then uh, I'll have a further question after that. Again, the question is, what did these symbols mean in the first century context? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is speaking in the first century context, in, in Palestinian context. And if you read the Old Testament, you will see that there are basically three basic foods mm -hmm. in Old Testament. So one is the bread. Without bread, there is no life. The second is, is, is wine. And the third is, is, is oil. So these were the three biblical foods, bread, wine, and oil. Without these, without these things, there is no, there is no life. Okay. And they, Jesus speaks about bread and white and wine as symbol of his, his body and his, his blood. But also after administering the Lord's Supper, we know that from the Gospel of John, he speaks about the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. who is symbolized by oil. So the ministry of Jesus, together with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is essential for life. Without them, there is no spiritual life. So Jesus took basic symbols from the first century setting to symbolize that he is the life, and without him, there is no spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And people and got it. People got it. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. And we do have all these central stories all throughout the Bible where bread, for example, is... Uh, a central image of God's sustenance for his people, of God taking care, God taking care of our basic needs, right? We have the manna in the in the Old Testament, in the desert. You know, God would send the manna every morning to make sure his people had food to eat every day. Um, Jesus in his ministry, has we have the multiplication of the bread. Those, uh, all of the Gospels tell us that same story, um, really showing how God takes care of basic needs of his people are hungry and God takes care of that. So the bread um, has that that um, connection to just God taking care of what we need. And obviously in the context of the Lord's Supper, the bread is more about, you know, the body of Christ, how he gave himself so that we could have life. So um, like Laszlo was saying, these are central images within the context of the culture that we're talking about that have these very basic but very central meanings. Um, same thing for blood, the blood symbol of a covenant, the symbol of um, the commitment that God makes with his people. And and on top of that, the blood is connected to life, to um, you know God giving his life in order that we can have life. Um, and, and that's the covenant that that we find. So it's very symbolic, very symbolic within the context of that culture. So the just interesting detail, just interesting detail, which we usually do not connect to the Lord's Supper. And that's the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He starts after baptism, he starts with fasting. And after 40 days, the tempter comes to him and he says, if you are the son of God, command to these stones to become loaves of bread. Mm -hmm. So bread is the basic, basic food without that there is no no life mm -hmm. so it's the basic uh, food that we need for life it's a, a symbol of sustaining the people of god and taking care of our needs it's also a symbol for his body given mm -hmm. for our salvation if if uh, i remember correctly so in the bible i remember that um the bread is uh, described in the Passover meal as unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. is, is there a particular symbolism and meaning why that has to be unleavened bread in the, in the Passover? Yes, again, as Keldi mentioned, we need to look at the story. There is a story behind. So the basic idea of the Exodus event was deliverance. And that deliverance came quite quickly. Uh, they need to leave Egypt, God's people. Is they need to leave Egypt quickly, so there was no time for for baking a, a bread and wake, waiting. You see, for hours or a day. Mm -hmm. So it's unleavened because uh, they did it in rush, very, 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 very quickly. Mm -hmm. 
and that reminds them about the certainty and quickness of the, God's deliverance. Mm -hmm. But in New Testament, when we talk about uh, the symbol of the bread, it is uh, without, uh, yeah, unleavened, because uh, yeast is the symbol of uh, of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus yeah. talks about about that. So the, the sacrifice of Christ was was pure. He did not commit sin. It was a full sacrifice, and it symbolizes the purity of that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And and what about the wine? Uh, is that real? wine, alcoholic beverage uh, that that we're talking about. What are we talking about and what do Adventists serve in the Lord's Supper when we serve the wine? Can you explain that a little bit to us? Well, I think there's two, two points to make to that question. First, again, pointing back to cultural context within the first century, um, it was very common to drink wine, but it's not pure wine. It was always the, the purpose of drinking so much wine in the first century is that water was contaminated. It was very hard to find pure water. So adding a little bit of wine to water would help purify the water. So within that context, we're not talking about 100% pure wine. It's, it's not about the alcohol. It's about, you know, mixing, diluting and things like that. So that's the first point I would make. And second, again, talking about the, the fermentation part of things, um, just like uh, leaven would be connected to sin. Um, I, in my understanding, the, the same applies for, uh, for fermented wine. Um, so within our church, within our context, we, we do not serve wine. We serve grape juice for those reasons. Mm. And in the first century context, they also had grape juice. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about wine, there were techniques how to preserve mm -hmm. wine to be, be without alcohol. So from ancient sources, we, we know some of these, mm -hmm. some of the techniques. Yes, and it's interesting, you know, if you were to serve alcohol at the communion service, at the Lord's Supper, uh, any person who has had a uh, alcohol addiction uh, would be automatically excluded from that uh, important remembering mm -hmm. and celebrating of, of God's. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just another additional reason uh, I think that we need to take into consideration here. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the bread and the wine. And wine actually in the Bible is a very generic term. It can mean alcoholic wine can mean just grape juice uh, from fresh pressed uh, grapes. And uh, I think that's what, what Jesus uh, was referring to here when, when he uh, used that in the Lord's Supper. So um, let, me, let me ask you uh, maybe a little uh, provocative question and, and critical question. Uh, I have heard people say that, uh, what do you do uh, when you are in a region of the world where you don't have access to grape juice or wine? Because in that region, there is just no grapes that are grown, you know? Uh, what do you do uh, if you don't have access to unleavened bread? Can we then, since it is just a, a ceremony that remembers something, uh, where can, can we then exchange those symbols? Can we have, you know, instead of bread, can we have, uh, let's say, pancakes? And it, in, in, instead of wine, can we have maybe a mango juice uh, and remember still what Jesus has done for us? Why are we stuck with the symbols uh, of bread and wine? <laughs> I think it is a very interesting question and provocative, yes, you, you are right. I don't know what to, to answer to it, but uh, the symbolism is, is is the most important. I mean, you can you can take the symbols uh, which are mentioned in the Bible and do nothing happen in your life, in your heart, okay? Uh, on the other hand, your preparation is also very important, key, how, how you approach the, the, the Lord's Supper. But still, uh, symbols are given in the scripture. You can't just take chips and cola, you see? Saying that, saying that, the meaning is important. So let's let's see chips and let's drink cola and there's the Lord's Supper. No, so if 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 there is some kind of adaptation, 
we can uh, need to be we need to be very very careful to be as close to the original as it, as it's possible so so the, the the basic idea is that these are symbols of Christ's atoning work mm-hmm. he is dead death and resurrection are symbolized in our our dedication, mm-hmm. dedication. yes i would i would uh, concur with what you just said uh, laszlo and i think it's it's important to remember that if Jesus, in that case, and God has given us a specific symbolism, mm-hmm. and uh, that symbolism is connected to specific things in the life of Jesus, his uh, sinless body that he has given for an atoning sacrifice, his, his blood, really, uh, that is uh, symbolized by the grape juice and the wine, uh, then I think we are not at liberty to just change that uh, uh, in, in, in any other way, because we would lose out on something. And it, it reminds me of a story in the Old Testament, you know, where um, God commanded uh, circumcision and uh, Moses didn't want to do that immediately. And it almost cost him his life. So it shows me that somehow when God uh, gives a symbolism, he expects us to be faithful to the initial uh, symbolisms that he has initiated and given us. And for that reason, I would say we're not at liberty to just uh, exchange uh, the symbol of bread and wine for anything else. Uh, but we we do well if we abide by what Jesus has initiated. I think this is very important what you said. We need to take seriously the Bible as God's word. Mm-hmm. If we do not take seriously, then we open up a door for all kinds of manipulation and so on. But now we need to be serious. Exactly. We need to be serious, and we need to be dedicated to the teaching of of the Bible. Now that leads me to yet another interesting aspect of the Lord's Supper, especially in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, that is part of the Lord's Supper. That is not part in many other churches, but that is biblical, uh, and that is the foot washing. You have mentioned that earlier already, Laszlo. So let's focus on that. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we also celebrate foot washing in connection with the Lord's Supper. What is that all about? I think the the, the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples uh, in John, it's it's a very meaningful story because it really shows this is we're talking about the Lord of the universe stooping down on his knees to wash the dirty feet of his disciples. Um, that shows what kind of Lord we serve. We serve a Lord who serves us, who gives himself for us, and who is willing to get down in the position of a servant to do for us what no one else could do. Um, so that that significance of this is the kind of Lord that we serve, and this is also the kind of um, example that we want to follow, an example of life of service for others. Um, all of that is encompassed in this, uh, in, in imitating what Christ did by washing the feet of one another in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Um, I think that's very meaningful and, um, you know, adds to the to that significance of what is what does it mean to mm. to partake here in, in the Lord's Supper. Okay, any additional thoughts uh, on that, Laszlo? Yes, we have a very detailed description of the foot washing in the Gospel of John in chapter uh-huh. 13. Uh-huh. And that's the basic biblical text which we need to, to, to turn. And let I just point out that, first of all, we do not celebrate foot washing in separation from Lord's Supper. Right. So the foot washing is a kind of preparation for it. And there is also a symbol of here. Mm-hmm. We are walking in our life. We are walking and we are in need of cleansing. We are in need of spiritual refreshing, you see, renewing of the covenant. And as we wash the feet of each other, that's how Jesus washes our life and restores our spiritual vitality so this is not only an option, a nice thing to practice if we wash, if we wash the feet of each other, because in Gospel of John, there's a very specific guidance, and I would like to read the text. Please, please, chapter yes. 13, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13 says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example 
that you also should do as I have done to yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So Jesus set us an example and he invited us, invited us to practice it. Yeah. Um, one other thing, building off of what Laszlo says here, the um, it's sometimes if if we're just looking at the the bread and the wine, it could easily become a very me focused thing. Um, this is what Christ did for me, and I'm remembering that, and which is all great. But I think the added um, ordinance of the of the foot washing puts that within the context of. Christ did this for me so that I can extend this to others, so that I can serve others. Uh, it's within that context of, you know, the what Christ is doing is for me and for others. And the, the service part of it just really emphasizes that aspect, I think. And it's I see here a connection with, with the Lord's Supper, because uh, in the Lord's Supper also you have that... Uh, that horizontal aspect, you see the mm -hmm. unity of the believers, demonstrating love and concern for each other. We have one bread which is broken into, into pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and here also we have people serving to people, people demonstrating care and love for each other. Yeah. Uh, humility is, is very, very important. Yeah, let me pick up on that uh, uh, last word, humility. I think really the foot washing is an act of humility. And if you if you think about it, it's a beautiful opportunity in the church, among the believers of Christ, uh, to show and express that there is really no uh, hierarchy and rank mm -hmm. in the church. I mean, uh, I have participated in foot washings where um, employer and employee mm -hmm. have washed each other's feet vice versa, you know, and, and there was no um, higher and lower. There was no, you know, and in the church, as followers of Jesus Christ in his kingdom, we are all his children. And therefore, we are, we are equal, so to speak. And, and that really is an expression of that humility uh, that I show to my Christian brother, that uh, a sister shows to her Christian sister, in the church and where we have that fellowship that that christ intends uh, for us to have all right so let's um maybe in the remaining minutes that we have um just uh go a little different route uh, we have talked about our biblical adventist uh, understanding of the lord's supper uh, other churches celebrate the lord's supper uh, a little different, have a, a, a different understanding of, of that. Can, can we just uh, briefly distinguish what, what is the difference between our understanding of the Lord's Supper as Seventh-day Adventists and let's say other Christians in, in other churches, the Catholic Church or some Protestant churches? You mentioned, Frank, at the very beginning of our conversation that the, the Lord's Supper unites Christians in a sense that every branch of Christianity practices it somehow, in, in some sense. But also, this is a question which divides Christians, <laughs> because they have many, many different interpretations. And you are systematic theologian, you know very well that some of the greatest discussions of in the Christian history were discussions about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. And there are different, different positions. Uh, even the reformers could not agree among themselves in 16th century. So basically, there are several basic positions. The first position was is a Catholic position, and the person who really formulated it was Thomas Aquinas in 13th century, and that's the concept of transubstantiation. So you have here a metaphysical change, the substance is changed. So according to the Catholic understanding, the bread is changed to the literal wine to literal blood and body of Christ. And the priest is the one who, who do that. So the priest is very important and the formula is, is very, very important. On the other hand, if we go to Protestantism, so uh, Luther, uh, Martin Luther, famous reformer from 16th century, he, he was advocating consubstantiation, consubstantiation. And the idea was that uh, the body and the bread and the blood and the wine coexist, okay? 
So it's not a transformation, but both of them, the bread and wine are there, but also the, the body and, and the wine, the body and the blood. On the other hand, uh, Calvin disagreed with Luther and there were some major discussions on that. Uh, Calvin's position was that Christ is present not bodily, not physically, but spiritually. So he talked about the dynamic presence of Jesus Christ. Of course, that dynamic presence was mediated uh, through, the, through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the fourth position is the position of Zwingli. For Zwingli, the Lord's Supper is, is, is merely a commemoration of, of, of Christ's death, which we need to receive, receive by faith, uh, by faith the benefits, the benefits of Christ. So we see at least four different positions, the Catholic, the Lutheran, the reformed position and, and Zwingli's, Zwingli's position. That's very interesting. So we don't have a, a strict sacramental understanding of uh, the Lord's Supper in the sense where the bread really is transformed, the substance of the bread is transformed. And in that sense, I literally take into myself Jesus Christ. But we see it more in the line of Zwingli and, and Calvin, uh, as we say in, in, in our fundamental belief that in this experience of communion, Christ is present to meet and strengthen his people. Mm -hmm. And he does that because we remember what he has done for us at the cross. And we look forward to the completion of that salvation process that he has initiated. I think uh, very important is Calvin's metaphor of the sun. He said that it's... Uh, so the sun, you, you feel it, you feel its influence. It's not here in your room and so on, but you feel its influence. So in the Lord's Supper, okay? I would I would slightly disagree with Zwingli who says that it's, it's merely a commemoration of Christ's death. Mm -hmm. Something more happens here, I believe. Christ is present mm -hmm. on a special way in our hearts, in our minds during the Lord's the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, Christ for the Holy Spirit. So it's not only a commemoration, yes. okay? Yes. But he is present somehow. He influences us as we, as the sun influences us. Uh, mm -hmm. Which indicates really, if, if, if we take that seriously, that uh, the Lord's Supper is, uh, is a serious mm -hmm. uh, commemoration. It's, it's not just an accidental happening uh, at our, you know, when we are in the mood to do that, but but we really now have to be reminded uh, and remind ourselves that uh, Christ Himself is present through the Holy Spirit, and uh, He 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 delights in that in that fellowship with His believer in the church, uh, and He is happy that we remember what He has done for us. And that brings up First um, Corinthians. Uh, chapter 11, verse um, 27, where Paul says, For this reason, whoever eats the bread and or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and uh, body and blood of the Lord. So Paul really emphasizes that seriousness of this. This is not just a normal meal or something that should be done without um, proper preparation and consciousness of what is going on. He goes on to say, a person should examine himself first and in this way, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So, um, you know, within this context that Paul is writing, the Corinthian church was just really taking advantage of this opportunity to, to really eat a lot. And they were not taking the proper time to understand what is the significance of this? What is the meaning of this, right? And in that way, they were just really taking advantage of the situation. But Paul reminds us, no, this is serious. And we need to come to the Lord's Supper with that understanding, with that humility. And um, so let's, let's pick up on what you just said, Kelly. I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up that passage in, in 1 Corinthians. What does it really mean to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? Mm -hmm. I still remember when I was a pastor and we had communion service and Lord's Supper, uh, there were uh, sometimes members who would not participate because they felt unworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they uh, had committed some sin that was present in their minds and and they felt they are not worthy to participate in the Lord's Supper. What is Paul talking about here when he says we should not uh, celebrate that in an unworthy manner? 
Well, one thing I would point out is, again, to the context here of what was going on in the Church of Corinth. Um, Paul points out that there's many divisions among them. So the church was not united. The church was constantly fighting with each other, fighting for status, fighting for position. And um, that that was a big problem because they're not approaching the Lord's Supper with unity, with humility, with service for one another, but with the opposite mindset. And another thing is the, um, the context here that they were eating and drinking without careful regard for what was going on, for um, trying to, to compete with one another, trying to eat their fill. So within this immediate context, that's what Paul is talking about, that kind of division and uh, competition and things like that. Um, so that would be my first answer. Maybe Laszlo has something more to add here. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's very important that you that you clearly brought up this text because this, this is the most complete text about the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I like very much how the New Revised Standard Version translates the Greek text here because it says, uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, mm -hmm. um, it's verse 29, for all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and read judgment against themselves. So without discerning, mm -hmm. consider it a trivial, you see, not not without any preparation. So Paul's point is that preparation is needed. Mm -hmm. The Lord's Supper. It's not only I walk, walk in and I take the symbols of Christ's body and blood. And he says here what kind of preparation is needed. Verse 28, Paul says, examine yourselves mm -hmm. and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So examine yourself. The effect of the Lord's Supper, I would, I would argue, the effect of the Lord's Supper depends on faith of the believer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Apostle Paul says at the very end uh, of, of his argument here that that's why many are weak among yourselves. Many are weak in the church uh, because they do not prepare, they do not take seriously, uh, they do not rededicate their lives. So so we should, we should uh, approach this as a very serious thing. It's it's, there is an element of holiness here. In Serbian language, for example, I lived in Serbia for more than 40 years. Many call it the Holy Supper. Mm. Okay, So it's not only an occasion. It's a Holy Supper because we rededicate ourselves to God. And examination is needed for that. And, and hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. If I'm, not, if I'm not prepared, I will not be blessed. Yes, yes. Part of that examination is really thinking, how is my relationship with my other brothers and sisters within the church? Do I have a problem with somebody? Is there an unresolved um, conflict there that might take humility on my part to recognize, to understand? Am I the problem here that uh, is causing this competition or this problem? And maybe it would be a good idea to, to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with somebody um, before taking the Lord's Supper. So all of those things play into it. And um, having that humility to understand where is my heart? Have I really given myself completely to God? Am I open to the working of the Holy Spirit within my life? And how is that affecting my relationship with others? Well, if I, yeah, go ahead. You wanted to say something. In, in the Old Testament, uh, when you had such, such serious occasions, fasting was required in the Old Testament. Um, in New Testament, we do not read about fasting as a requirement for preparation for the Lord's Supper, but I know that many of our believers in our church practice it, and I think it's not a bad idea. Mm. So that, uh, summing, uh, summarizing the things uh, that you just mentioned, means that the Lord's Supper really is a, uh, a special, sacred, holy occasion that reminds us of what Jesus did for us, uh, the covenant that he wanted to uh, establish with us. So the Lord's Supper really is not, um, is not uh, a birthday party. <laughs> it, is a joy, it is a joyful occasion because we are filled with joy and gratitude for what he has done. And yet it is a serious and uh, contemplative rite mm -hmm. where we remember what he has done and when we uh, share in fellowship, mm -hmm. in foot washing and in self-examination mm -hmm. that we want to be in fellowship with him who is our Lord and Savior.
I fully agree with you that we need to have an assurance of salvation mm -hmm. when we come to the Lord's table. But I would just add that we are looking into two directions. Okay, yeah. not only only back to the death of Christ, we remember what He did did for us, but we are also looking forward with anticipation that His promises are truthful and He will fulfill His promises and He will restore the planet because. Uh, we read in the Bible, we should practice this until he comes. Yes. Until he yes. comes. That Advent element, Adventist element, it's very, very important. So looking backward, looking forward, and if we have that that uh, two-dimensional looking, okay, into two-direction looking, then can we live with assurance in God's promises in the present? Yes. I think that was a wonderful final statement that you just made. Uh, our time is, is up, basically, and, and I enjoyed our conversation. I hope that you, as you have listened, mm -hmm. have gained a deeper understanding, uh, uh, a deeper appreciation of the meaning and the significance of the Lord's Supper for your life. And if you've never experienced the Lord's Supper in the full biblical dimension with the foot washing and everything that goes along with it, as, uh, as we have uh, heard from Scripture, we invite you to... Uh, to experience that, to maybe join a Seventh-day Adventist church and uh, see the celebration of the Lord's Supper there. And uh, may God richly bless you as you explore the Word of God, as you study it deeper, and as you join us for another presentation of what Adventists believe. God be with you and God bless you.